Have you ever heard of the butterfly effect? It's the idea that if you went back in time and did something as simple as step on a butterfly, it would create a ripple effect with the power to change the course of human events dramatically. Look, this video really isn't as dramatic as that, but I'm doing a series where I take a look back on big AFL trades of the past and consider their impact not only on the teams involved, but a variety of other teams too. I've done one on the Tim Kelly trade already, which you can find by clicking the top right icon of this video. I thought that one had a pretty big ripple effect, but I think it pales in comparison to Lockie Neal requesting a trade to the Brisbane Lions. Lockie Neal has obviously won two Brownlow medals since for a Brisbane side that rose rapidly, but it's actually the trade and draft ripple effect it had that I'm most interested in. Imagine a world where Luke Jackson and Hayden Young both got drafted to the Gold Coast, Fremantle have both Ben King and Bobby Hill, and Port Adelaide's captain, Connor Rosie, isn't even on their list. If you go deep enough into this alternate reality, it leads you to a world where Caroline Wilson is appointed CEO of the AFL, Marcus Bontempelli plays for West Coast, and Margot Robbie finally decides to respond to my numerous emails. Okay, the last part is a joke, but a man can dream. Actually no, screw it, this is my video. Margot Robbie is my girlfriend. Now what makes this ripple effect so deep is that, if you remember, Fremantle leveraged the Neil trade request to target Jesse Hogan and Rory Lobb as well, and it's fascinating to consider what might have been if the Dockers had made different decisions. I actually think the most impacted club in this scenario is the Melbourne Football Club. I think you could almost make the claim that if Hogan didn't leave to Fremantle, it could have even cost them the 2021 flag. Maybe. Sort of. I'll let you decide. In this video, I consider three distinct scenarios of how this trade period could have played out differently. Make sure you stick around because scenario two is a real doozy. Also, make sure you subscribe. Scenario one, Lockie Neal stays at Fremantle and they don't target Hogan and Lobb. Lockie Neal has won two Brownlow medals since leaving Fremantle. And so in the scenario where he doesn't join Brisbane, it's easy to make the claim that Brisbane may not have shut up to finals contention so quickly and that Fremantle may have been an improved team over that same period. That claim is easy to make, but difficult to quantify. So for now, let's just consider the other trade and draft outcomes here. In the actual trade period, Brisbane did a deal with Port Adelaide that sent pick five and Sam Mays to the power in exchange for pick six and a number of later picks. But this was only possible because Fremantle had traded their own pick six to the power for picks 11, 23, and 30. Why did they do that? Well, this was likely due to the fact that they were targeting trades for Jesse Hogan and Rory Lobb. If they had not gone for those players, this deal would have been completely unnecessary. In that case, Brisbane may have retained their pick 5 and taken one of Ben King or Connor Rosie. Fremantle would have retained the pick that came next and possibly taken whichever player Brisbane didn't. In short, if Neil hadn't left Brisbane and Frio hadn't gone for Hogan and Lobb, Port Adelaide's chance of getting their current captain on their list would have been virtually zero. Scenario 2. Neil stays at Fremantle and Frio try and get Hogan and Lobb. By the way, this True Footy video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Now, what is BetterHelp? Essentially, it is a platform that connects you with credentialed therapists who are trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. If you're somebody that has been considering starting therapy, I can understand if there's a few things about it that might make you feel a little bit uneasy. Specifically, sometimes the face-to-face -face interaction component of it can seem a little bit intimidating. And also you wanna make sure that you get the right therapist for you. Sometimes the right therapist for you is not in your area. And this is why BetterHelp's good because it matches you with these therapists. And then you can schedule those therapy sessions at a time that is convenient for you over phone call, video chat, or even messaging if that is what's convenient for you. To get started in the process, click the link in the description below or in the pinned comment. It basically takes to a survey, you fill that out, it helps them assess your specific needs and in most cases you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. So if you do get matched with a therapist and you're feeling like this isn't quite the right fit for you, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. So if you think you might be someone who could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description below or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. Now clicking that link does help support the channel but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp so you can be matched with a therapist who can listen and help you. Considering Fremantle's position at the time, it is conceivable that they could have facilitated trades for Hogan and Lobb as well as retain Neil. But let's consider how they might have done these deals. In reality, the deal for Jesse Hogan included pick 6 and 23 heading to the Ds. He had just come off a 47 goal season and had kicked over 40 goals in 3 of his first 4 seasons at AFL level. For the record, Melbourne flipped pick 6 for Stephen May and then drafted Tom Sparrow, but we will come back to that side of things soon. Rory Lobb cost Fremantle picks 11 and 19, while they got pick 14 back. So naturally this particular deal can only be emulated if Frio trade pick 6 down with Port Adelaide. 
But without Lockie Neal requesting a trade, this becomes more complicated because pick six would likely be needed to get Jesse Hogan too. In other words, Fremantle suddenly have their work cut out trying to get both of these talented forwards. One possible pathway is that they do trade pick six to Port Adelaide, putting the power back in the race for Connor Rosie, and Fremantle end up with picks 11, 23 and 30. This allows them to do a similar deal with GWS for Rory Lobb to the one that happened in reality, albeit without the use of pick 19 from Brisbane. To avoid getting too complicated, let's assume Fremantle get Lobb and hold pick 14 in the draft, just like in reality. So to get Jesse Hogan on their list from Melbourne, their best assets for trades would be pick 14 that year and their future first round selection. Even with Neil still on Fremantle's list, Melbourne may have likely valued this as a top 10 selection. Would this be enough to prize Hogan loose? Given he was still contracted at the Demons, Melbourne could have simply said no thank you. But in the background, the Ds were keen to get Stephen May from Gold Coast and may have been inclined to do a deal anyway. Without a guaranteed pick six, Melbourne probably would have tried to get both pick 14 that year and Fremantle's future first round selection off them, given their need for trade collateral and the undeniable talent of a contracted Jesse Hogan at that time. Now Fremantle would have the choice here of spending a premium to get Hogan on their list early, which would have capped off an amazing trade period, or wait until he was out of contract. Let's assume for the purposes of this that they deal 14 and a future first round pick for Hogan, with some sweeteners coming back from the Ds. Fremantle get all of their targets and they hold on to Lockie Neal, but had they aggressively traded out their future first rounder, they would have lost the pick that took Hayden Young the next year. So to summarise this scenario, if Fremantle had kept Neal and traded for Hogan and Lobb, it may well have cost them Hayden Young, but finishing higher up on the ladder that season may have done that anyway. Now there's no doubt without pick six, Melbourne would have found it trickier to secure Stephen May and Cade Collajasny from the Suns, so they would need an alternate trade deal. Bear in mind also that because of their trade for Jake Lever the previous year, they held no 2018 first round draft pick. Their best asset for trade would have been Fremantle's future first, as well as their own future first round draft pick. Given both of these picks could have conceivably be predicted as mid to late first round picks, it's possible the Ds would have given up both to get May and then get something back in return. But here's the kicker. Melbourne plummeted to second last the following year, having just qualified for a prelim in 2018. If the Ds had indeed traded both of these picks to the Suns, Gold Coast could have had picks 1, 2 and 3 in the 2019 draft, as well as Fremantle's first round selection. We know the first two picks were Rowan and Anderson, but they could well have added Luke Jackson to this mix. And if Fremantle didn't improve with Neil Steele in the side, Gold Coast could have ended up with Hayden Young too. Although if Fremantle had improved, they may have just gone with their original pick of Sam Flanders. Scenario 3. Neil goes to Brisbane and Fremantle don't trade for Hogan and Lobb. Scenario 2 involves some mental gymnastics, so thankfully this one is a fair bit more simple. It plays out a little bit more similarly to Scenario 1. Remember, we established that Fremantle's pick swaps with Port Adelaide were only necessary to help get them Hogan and Lobb. In this scenario, Port can't trade up for pick 5 because they don't hold Fremantle's pick 6, and Brisbane likely wouldn't have done a deal trading 5 to Port for 11, 23 and 30 because it would have ruined their deal for Lockie Neal. So Brisbane are then obliged to trade pick 5, 19 and 55 to Fremantle for Lockie Neal and pick 30, which is basically what the original deal was. Fremantle hold picks 5, 6 and 19 in the 2018 draft in one of the strongest drafts in recent memory. They then still have the option to trade with a keen Port Adelaide for these picks, but it's hard to see them really being tempted. In this scenario, Fremantle would have access to both Connor Rosie and Ben King, and presumably would have picked them both. Bailey Smith was taking a pick later, but given there were homesickness rumours, interstate clubs may well have left him alone. Their pick 19 became pick 22 on the night, where GWS took Xavier O'Halloran. They could have taken O'Halloran themselves, but they may have been tempted by the local talent Bobby Hill who went two picks later. If Fremantle don't go for Hogan and Lobb, it also puts Melbourne once again in an awkward position trying to get Stephen May. We don't need to go over it all again, but Melbourne would almost certainly have to part ways with their Luke Jackson pick to the Gold Coast Suns, and at the time, even that may not have been considered a good enough offer. As for the Giants, well, they retain Lobb in this scenario, but their draft picks may have played out differently. If they don't deal with Fremantle, they don't have the picks that took Haitley or O'Halloran. They would have instead entered the draft where Fremantle took Sam Sturt. 
They could have gone with Sturt, or they may have taken someone else like Xavier Dersma, who went a pick later. All in all, GWS won't lose too much sleep over their involvement in this trade. So let's try and summarize my take on the ripple effect throughout the league had Fremantle's 2018 trade period gone differently. Had Neil stayed at Fremantle, naturally it would have had a profound impact on Brisbane and Fremantle's respective on-field fortunes in the ensuing seasons. Gold Coast would have had even better access to young talent, potentially drafting Luke Jackson and Hayden Young as a result of a different trade with Melbourne for Stephen May. In hindsight, Fremantle's decision to trade for Hogan and Lobb in 2018 potentially cost them one of Ben King or Connor Rosie. Had they also traded Neil in that scenario, they could have had both, and perhaps even Bobby Hill. But, repeating the same logic I outlined in the Tim Kelly video, Fremantle made the right decision given the information available at the time, and were generally applauded for their shrewd business in that trade period. Had Fremantle not traded for Jesse Hogan, it's interesting to consider the huge ripple effect on the Melbourne Football Club that this would have had. For a start, they wouldn't have the pick from Fremantle where they drafted Premiership player Tom Sparrow. But also, their deal for Stephen May would have been much more difficult. It likely would have cost them Luke Jackson, another Premiership player who did perform strongly in that grand final when the game was there to be won. Not only that though, it would have also meant they would not have Caleb Windsor or Matthew Jefferson as they received these picks trading Jackson, ironically, to Fremantle three years later.